Hi, I'm Sophia. I am a Palantir software engineer intern, and I want to tell you about what I worked on this summer. So I worked on Foundry, and just to give you a background as to what Foundry is, imagine a scenario where we're trying to distribute vaccines as optimally as possible, and Hospital A and Hospital B are right across the town from each other. Hospital A has 5,000 vaccines, but has 10,000 appointments to serve, and Hospital B has 10,000 vaccines and 5,000 appointments to serve. So you can see very easily if we just transport 5,000 vaccines from Hospital B to Hospital A, we can get 5,000 people vaccinated. So this would be a huge net positive with very little cost for the company. So this is actually very difficult to spot for many companies out there because in most cases you have all of your data across different databases. So the hospital inventories or the supply might be in a PostgreSQL database, then our demand or the vaccine appointments might be in the AWS database, and then the distribution partners manage all their distribution information and the spreadsheet. So without some automation service to bring all three of these together, it can be very difficult to spot these very easy ones for businesses, like just transporting 5,000 vaccines from one hospital to another. So this is what Foundry tries to solve. So what we do is we import all three of these databases into Foundry, we process them, and then we make one big database that contains all of the data. And then on top of that, we build all of our functions and automations that help us spot these patterns. And then you can create dashboards on top of it to help businesses spot the needs. So out of these three databases, we created this dashboard. And here we can see that the vaccine supply in hospital A is 5,000, even though we have 10,000 appointments, and then it's flipped into hospital B. So if someone is looking at this and they want to fix this problem, they can just click the create new shipment button and then add a new row and then ship some vaccines from hospital B into hospital A to make sure that we're distributing vaccines as optimally as possible. So that is really all that Palantir Foundry does. We help businesses make use of their data and use it as optimally as possible to serve their business needs. Okay, so now that you know what Foundry does, what is Zero to Value, the team that I interned on this summer? What's really cool about it is that the devs here are very talented. All of them are top 10 in Forge, which is our fronted monorepo, uh, when they're active in it. So I guess as an example, my, my mentor is number six right now and he joined Palantir less than a year ago um, and he just graduated. So it's just a very, very high horsepower team. I'm super grateful to be on it. And you might ask, what product did leadership assign this team to work on? And the cool answer is, None. So what we do is we empower customers to get value out of Foundry as quickly and as easily as possible. So what that means is that we're in charge of finding customer pain points, then scoping out solutions, and then implementing them from start to finish. So it's a lot of autonomy. It's really, really cool and super fun. I had a great time this internship. Okay, so before I get into the main projects that I worked on over the summer, I want to show you some like very zero to value style side quests that I went on. So first is our Hack Week project, which was a Foundry desktop app. So Hack Week during Palantir is a week where you just get to work on anything that you want. And then the top projects out of that make it to finals. And then they pick a few winners out of the finalists. So this project made it to finals. We were very proud to, to make it. Um, and the premise is that Foundry is a platform designed for everyone. It designed to work for consumers who view the dashboards, it's designed to work for engineers who have to build the workflows from scratch, and it's designed for admins who have to configure Foundry. But what we wanted to build is something just for the engineers who are building the workflows and hyper-optimize our platform for that. So we created a desktop app. Um, on the left, you can see some of the architecture decisions that we had to make. And on the right are some screenshots of our new vision for Foundry. The highlight for me was uh, 1v1 versus a very seasoned dev named Ankit at Palantir. Uh, I ended up going against him because I emailed our CTO, Sean, who replied, which was super cool. And he nominated him specifically. And we had this demo of me on desktop versus him on browser doing a 1v1. Um, and then like, you know, our desktop app won because it's designed for builders. So that was a big, big highlight. It's like super cool that leadership was really involved and willing to chat with us on this. Now, second thing that I did a little side quest on was a signed up revamp. This is what it looked like initially. And when you want to install a new module onto your Foundry account, you have to enter your enrollment URL. And the problem with this is that when you go through the signup flow, they never actually, ne never actually email you your enrollment URL, which is where you can log into your Palantir account. And I think this is very confusing for a lot of customers because they don't even realize that you can't lo just log in on palantir.com. You have to have 
your own URL to log into. And we never email, email it to them in the first place. We expect them to write it down right after the sign up process. So I think this is very confusing and it was something that even I was like very confused by when I was trying to create my own account. Then you can see our new sign up page. These are the cool little drop downs that we made explaining where you can find your U enrollment URL, which is this little hacky setup where you have to click set up account and then find the enrollment URL. And then we also explain what an enrollment URL is. Okay, so now onto my main work for the summer. I'll have to tell you a little story first to motivate the app that I worked on, which helps improve the customer journey a lot in Foundry. So imagine you're a Palantir engineer wrapping up a busy day at the office. Your phone rings. You recognize the voice, an old customer you built a workflow for ages ago. Now I know you've explained this to us already many times over the past years, but my colleagues and I keep forgetting. How do we create a new type of resource? Can we find a time to meet so you can teach us again? <sighs> you've explained this very basic workflow to them so many times, it's honestly embarrassing. And it's about time for you to build a walkthrough for your workflow so customers have a quick reference when they forget and you can stop explaining it. So that's our app. It's, it's walkthroughs, it's to help customers navigate the workflows that our engineers built for them. The first improvement I made for walkthroughs is highlighting nodes in this app called Solution Design. So this is what a solution design diagram can look like. It's pretty overwhelming and you don't know where to put your eyes, even if you have a step telling you to look at the data connector node. What is the data connector node? No one knows. You can now click configure diagram state right here if you add a solution design diagram into your walkthrough and you can select all the nodes that you want to be highlighted within that step. You can see that at each step, a different node is highlighted and this helps our customers draw their eyes into the correct node. So that was the first thing I built. This is a little overview of how it works, but the most interesting thing I think is that we use a backend pattern in the front end. These two apps, Walkthrough Panel and Solution Design app, they're completely separate, so they have no way of sharing information. Walkthrough Panel, when it wants Solution Design Diagram to highlight a node because it navigates to a new step, it'll post a message to the window selling, uh, saying to highlight solution design nodes and then post the node reads as well. During that time, Solution Design app will be listening to the browser for any highlight solution design node events. And then when it detects them, it will pass it on to the solution design diagram and then highlight the appropriate nodes. So you see, this is really just an API, which is pretty cool because we don't build a front end to front end API, but in this case, it made sense. Okay, so now onto a couple smaller tasks that I worked on. First is this primary resource indicator. Uh, a lot of our builders were confused about which resource is the one navigated to out of a list of resources because you can have multiple links per step. So my designer and I worked on making this process more seamless to help them understand what to do. Um, and then another thing that I actually didn't code on at all, but I was asked to create this disable navigation and hide resource toggle. Um, one toggle for each to help address some customer pains that we were experiencing. And as I was working through this with our designer, we discovered that this is actually not at all the optimal way to approach this problem and that there were many different customer pains that each had their own solution. It was a very good lesson in that my job as a dev is to solve customer pain primarily. I want to empower them to do what they want on the platform and it's not just to blindly follow specs. So it was a very good experience, even though I didn't end up coding this feature up. So now onto my main project, which is improving the bridge text editing experience within walkthroughs. So the current walkthroughs editor looks something like this, where you're just writing in plain markdown and we have a few walkthroughs flavored HTML tags like this collapsible and this AIP assist question. And then when this is rendered within the walkthrough, this is what you actually see rendered, which is completely different from what you typed in. Some of our walkthrough builders, they don't know how to use markdown. The vision is we'd like to build a what you see is what you get editor. And then on top of that, to create a more integrated experience within walkthroughs, we want to add some rich embeddings like this example of a resource that we have some nice UI around and we want to link to when we click on it. And then we also want to add support for video, audios, and PDFs. So this is what the thumbnails will look like. And then this is what you would see rendered when you click on the thumbnail. Okay, so this took a lot of decomp on my part. There was like two weeks where I was just not coding at all, which felt very uncomfortable. And I had to meet with several different teams to make this a reality. But I'll walk you through the three major decisions that we had to make and then how I'm gonna go about implementing them and then my progress so far. Decision number one, how do we store text embeddings in the backend? 
So the challenge here is that we need to allow users to duplicate walkthroughs. So here you can see in the text, we have a few different RIDs that we're referencing, and these RIDs are pointing to objects that live within Foundry. And the challenge is when we duplicate the walkthrough, we want all of these resources to be duplicated. But right now, if we were to just copy and paste this walkthrough as is, not change the description or the RIDs, the new walkthrough would be pointing to the exact same resources, which would run into problems with permissions, it would run into problems if this ed walkthrough owner edited the objects and then they're reflected to this walkthrough owner. This is just not what we want. And what we do want is a deep copy where this walkthrough when duplicated has its own resources. So you might think, okay, why don't we just like regex the reds, we find and replace them and then we duplicate the resources. But the problem here is if you don't, if you're not very, very careful about this, you can end up duplicating resources more times than intended. So as you can see here, we reference the same resource twice within the text, and both of these are referencing this compass resource. But if we just duplicate this and find and replace the RIDs, then we might end up with two copies of the resource, which is not what we want. We only want one copy. So, okay, how do we go about this? So the solution that we ended up coming up with is we have a mapping of UUIDs to compass resources. And the first time that we reference the resource within the walkthrough, we generate a UUID in the front end, and then we map that to the red and then update it on the back end. Why is this advantageous? It's because now when we duplicate the walkthrough, all we have to do is iterate through these UUIDs and then create new RIDs and new resources. So say I want to duplicate this, all I have to do is replace the RIDs and I don't have to change the text at all, no in-place in string manipulation. This is all that we have to do, and this walkthrough too is now good to go with its own set of resources. All right, now decision two, how do we add support for video, audio, and PDFs? What it came down to is these two different ways to upload media that we have, the first of which is called artifacts, second which is called media sets. So the advantage of artifacts is that we already support our images and GIFs via the artifact repository, it easily supports different media types, but the problem is that it doesn't really have first-class support within Foundry. It's much lower level and it's quite bug prone. Um, the advantage of media sets is that this is just a new team in Foundry that is trying to make our life as easy as possible within, uh, with regards to uploading media. But the problem is that this already requires a media set to exist within Foundry before you can upload media. And what would really like is for the user to be able to just drag and drop media into the walkthrough and then like not have to think about this concept of a media set at all. So the advantage here is that it's more abstracted and since there's going to be less code that I'm writing, it's going to be less bug prone. And another advantage is that it has increasing support within Foundry, but the downside is that I think some users would find it less intuitive and a big point of this project is to actually make our editor more intuitive for a larger variety of users. So that's kind of a downside. So the solution that we ended up going with here is media sets and what we want done is when we add an image into the description text, it will create a hidden media set unless one already exists um, that is not visible anywhere within Foundry, but it allows a user to upload all of their data and their uh, media into it. So it allows us to have all the advantages of a media set in that we don't have to be granular about when the data is uploaded and how it's managed, um, we can just leave it to the media set to manage. Um, and we have all these really nice UI components built out of the box, but we also hide the idea of the media set away from users who don't need to know about it, don't want to know about it, and just want to add images, videos, PDFs into their walkthroughs. Decision three, how do we migrate from our walkthroughs flavored markdown editor to rich text editor? So it turns out we already have a very nice rich text editor that lives within Foundry that was built just like a month or two ago. And it takes Markdown as input and it converts it into this data structure called MDAS or Markdown Abstract Syntax Tree. And then from there it converts it to the language that the editor speaks, which is Slate. So this works really well and almost entirely works out of the box for us. But the problem is that we have these custom tags that I mentioned earlier, like AIP Assist. Um, that the Markdown abstract index tree just simply does not know how to handle. It doesn't know how to handle HTML in the first place, much less our custom HTML tags that we have here. So what would be really nice is if we could replace our HTML tags with these things called directives, which are essentially the same as HTML, but 
there they have different syntax so you can see here we have like this triple colon then the tag name and then the attributes um, and the one advantage that they have over html that makes it easier for them to parse is that they have a semblance of nesting as i'll show you in a second um, but if we could just translate all of our HTML tags into directives, then we could easily convert it into Markdown and then add support for directives and then convert it into Slate and have good support with this nice new rich text editor that Foundry is building. Okay, so as I mentioned, if we just translate this into, mark into directives, it'll be good. This is what I was talking about with the nesting earlier. Here, this outer collapsible and inner collapsible have the exact same syntax within the HTML tags but within directives, the outer one has four colons and then the inner one has three colons to indicate that the outer one is the parent. To avoid building an HTML parser and instead just do a tree traversal, what we do is we translate it into MDAS, which is Markdown Abstract Syntax Tree, as I mentioned, and then into HAST, which is HTML Abstract Syntax Tree. And then this allows us to do a tree traversal and not have to worry about any sort of HTML parsing with a constant function that I wrote. And then we go back to hast and then mdas and then to markdown with directives. Okay, so how do we do this traversal? I'll describe this briefly, but the idea is we have this tree that represents this, this markdown. The title mark, uh, walkthroughs markdown is an h2 tag and then it's children are, is just this text walkthroughs markdown. And then similarly, you can look at this collapsible. We have this collapsible tag and then another collapsible tag to represent this. And here it says content, over here it says content. That's kind of the idea. So the algorithm, what it does first is cal calculate all the nesting levels. So this collapsible is going to be at a nesting level zero. And then this one is going to be a nesting level one all the other nodes that have nothing to do with directives don't get computed a nesting level. And then we do another traversal where we find all of our directives and then we split them up into an opening node and a closing node, and then we flatten the tree. So here, this HTML tag, because it had a nesting level of zero, it gets the most number of colons possible. And you can see here, we have a collapsible tag, an opening one, and a closing tag, and then we flatten the tree. Now we're gonna repeat it with the second collapsible node. We highlight it, okay, nesting level one, this is the innermost one. So only three colons, and then we're gonna flatten. So this is the tree that we end up with, and now it represents the markdown with directives that we want. If we take a look here, you can see I have the rich text editor built in right below our markdown editor. So if I didn't have my feature flag turned on, then this bottom editor would not be here. But you can see this markdown is rendered as a heading two, and then our HTML tags are rendered as components, exactly how we want them to. And you can see that these components, they, they work just as you would expect. If I even click the AIP assist question, it will trigger it. I can edit it as well. So here you can see like new question. And then if I save, you can see the actual data model behind the scenes, which are the directives. And you can see that it also edited the, the title prop into new question, which is what I typed below. And as well, just wanted to highlight the nesting here. The outermost parent has five colons and then the innermost one has three. That is where we got to with the rich text editor. I'm working on shipping everything into prod this week. So hopefully it's nice and complete before my internship ends. And I just want to give one more shout out to my team. Uh, Brandon, who is my mentor, was like beyond helpful. He just knows the answer to everything. It would always make sure that any needs I had were always prioritized. And also a big thank you to my lead, Jake, who um, I also got to know last summer where he was also very, very helpful to me. Um, and he's just always there for me if there's anything I need or if Brandon's out. Please feel free to connect on LinkedIn or reach out if you have any questions or are interested in interning at Palantir. And yeah, thank you so much.